Deci eu mulțumesc, Alexandru, mulțumesc tuturor celor care au organizat, au permis organizarea acestei întâlniri. Vreau să încep prin, spunându-vă să-mi cer scuze pentru că nu mai stăpânesc așa de bine gramatica și, și vocabularul românesc. Sunt plecat de aproape 20, 40 de ani. Uh, și, uh, dar promit ca data viitoare să, să vă fac o prezentare în română deci o să, o să vă propun să o fac în, în engleză și uh, discuția, întrebările, răspunsurile să fie în, în limba română So um, Today I would like to, to present you the Technology Transfer Office uh, based our, um, on our experience in the, the Ecole Polytechnique uh, Federal in Lausanne. Uh, I will try to show you a little bit of the challenges that we faced. It was a long story, it was not so simple. Uh, and also the solutions that we found and uh, maybe some pragmatic ways of, of, uh, of starting doing something here. Um, the, the main challenge actually in, in technology transfer is uh, because of these two cultures, these two worlds, uh, which are rather different. Um, and um, uh, the first is the university where we all know uh, the basic values are, well, teaching, research is driven by publication of scientific results. Uh, and also, of course, by recognition by peers. On the other side, industry thinks and is driven by development, by products on the market, by increasing sales, and uh, naturally, uh, the secret is governing the, uh, that world. Uh, so the challenge lies, uh, lies here. Uh, there is a gap between these two worlds. And there are a number of bridges between them. Uh, the first one is rather natural. The students, the PhD students also, that uh, uh, study at the university and then uh, uh, go to industry. Uh, professors, uh, both ways, uh, of course, and uh, uh, we also encouraged a lot in Switzerland um, uh, to hire professors with an industrial background Uh, so that they bring a little bit of, of that culture, the industrial culture, uh, in the university. Uh, this can also be enhanced, for example, by internship programs. There are, uh, for example, students uh, in the, from the university that uh, do their, uh, say, master work or uh, uh, PhD thesis within the industry. And the other side round, Uh, whereas uh, people from um, researchers from industry would come to the university and do, for example, their PhD study uh, at the university. So this was rather natural uh, uh, as a bridge. Of course, there are other uh, bridges to be implemented uh, as collaborations between industry and university, and these are governed and By, by specific research contracts. I think you, you, you already have uh, some of them. Uh, maybe you call them development contracts. I, we, we can discuss that later. Uh, of course, there are a lot of services uh, in case an industrial partner wishes to have specific tests to be performed at the, at the university or a specific work to, to, uh, for the development of a prototype or whatever. Uh, Licensing. Licensing is, is important. It's maybe the end of it, uh, and uh, it, it is exactly what's necessary to be done whenever in, an invention is coming out from your re research, and it needs to be transferred to uh, an industrial partner. At last, but not least, startups. This is a very important vector for transferring know-how and um, intellectual property rights. So for all these bridges, uh, the Technology Transfer Office is really um, uh, an important uh, uh, catalyst. Uh, not only a catalyst, but it's also the, the entity that would uh, develop the tools, the research contracts, the services, the licensing agreements, the procedure for 
announcing an invention, the services for the uh, researchers so that they make one step uh, towards uh, that relation with industry, which is necessary to transfer um, their inventions. You see here uh, actually the, the history at EPFL, so because actually what I will talk about is really based on our experience at EPFL, Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, and you see that it was not something that started overnight. It, it, it takes time and it, it took a lot of effort. Uh, actually, it started in uh, 1986. Uh, at that time, we implemented uh, what we called an industrial liaison program. Uh, it's, uh, it was a, a program where uh, the uh, uh, it, a databases was developed. Uh, and on that databases, you had comp competencies from uh, university labs, different fields and where they were active. And also on the same database, uh, you had um, um, a list of companies in the ecosystem of EPFL uh, and also, well, more broadly, uh, more broadly in Switzerland. Um, at that time, of course, where there was no web. So... Um, uh, actually, the, the, the money, to the, the resources to implement that were, were there to, uh, to pay the people. There were four or five people that really uh, tried to put together that, that databases. Well, today, I think you uh, can have a look on the Research for Industry database. It's, uh, uh, it's already there, it's, um, and it can be really helpful to try to identify uh, to which partner you can talk because you have some technologies which, uh, which are in, in, in its field of interest and uh, uh, field of activities. And vice versa, if an industrial partner is looking on the data database, it should also find the right partner in uh, the institutes uh, for research or uh, other universities. Uh, two years later, in 1988, uh, we established a policy for research contracts and partnership. What did that mean? It's actually we, um, we developed uh, uh, template agreements, standard agreements, that uh, could be implemented by uh, every lab of the, of the university uh, in case such lab wanted to enter into a, a collaboration, research uh, collaboration with an industrial partner, or in case it wanted to, to have a service agreement or to have an industrial grant or a consortium agreement between several universities uh, or licensing agreement to a startup or to existing companies. Uh, so everything, technology transfer really started, say, in 88. Uh, then in 93, it was the creation of this tech first technology transfer office. It was called the Industrial Relation Office at that time. Uh, we were two people uh, for uh, all, the, all the university. And uh, we really continued to, to move forward and to, to help also the management of the university to implement a number of other actions and programs in the field of innovation and technology transfer. Um, in 1998, uh, we had our first legal council that uh, joined our office. We were three and the secretary. And, uh, well, now we are about, uh, we, we are 10 people. Uh, an important aspect I would like to, uh, to focus on is uh, in 2004, um, uh, it, was a, it was a very strong commitment of the university to um, nominate a vice president for innovation and technology transfer. So this really gave us, the technology transfer, and all the innovation activities around, a lot of, uh, a lot of support and um, uh, show the, oh, thanks, super, thank you very much. Uh, showed, uh, uh, showed that the, the, um, the university was really supporting strongly these technology transfer activities. There were a number of other, uh, other actions, like the, the Inno grants. These were some uh, uh, grants to help 
uh, young uh, student, well, students after their PhDs or their master to start a business. Uh, and actually, well, there was a seed fund in 2008, and maybe the last one was in 2011. It was a proof of concept, but I will talk a little bit more about that later. The TTO stakeholders, uh, there are a variety of, of stakeholders uh, of the technology transfer office. And it is really important to, to have a very good relationship and to build trust with all these stakeholders. On the first side, there are the researchers, the professors, the PhD students. Uh, of course, you have all the industrial ecosystem uh, with research people from industry, also with business people, with legals. You do have a lot of interactions with patent attorneys. We have a network of about 20 to 30 patent uh, attorneys worldwide, uh, and uh, uh, some of them are close to the university so they, that we can ring them uh, in the evenings or during the weekend because there is something urgent to be done. So it's very important to, to have that proximity with uh, one or two uh, patent uh, attorneys. Uh, startups, this of course is something that uh, we really encourage and are still encouraging very much. Uh, we have about 10 to 12 startups uh, every year um, and uh, it, it needs a lot of uh, involvement. Of course, when you talk about startups, one has to think also to the VC environment uh, around the, uh, the startups and they are very often coming to us to discuss those early stages. Uh, before investing uh, in the startup. So uh, for this is also that a technology transfer office is really a, a very important uh, partner. Sorry, venture capital, sorry. Venture capitalists that, that invest can be also business angels, all those who invest in the early stages of a, uh, of a venture. Of a, and of course, university management, as I told you before, it's crucial that there is a strong support from the university management, also from government, in order to have this activity uh, take over. Okay, so for that, you need to have staff, and uh, staff that has credibility and trust, both uh, towards, uh, with the, the internal stakeholders, but also, of course, with the external uh, stakeholders. Uh, and uh, again, a technology transfer office is a service. Uh, it's not uh, an entity that will decide top-down what to do with an invention. It is uh, it's an, a service office that will work very closely with the inventors, with the researchers, the professors, uh, and align with them in order to take the right decisions. There will be no success if... Uh, there is no consensus around the decision to file a patent, to enter into a collaboration with an industrial partner, to license it. it it's, it's really something very strong, and this is why stay close to the inventors is important. Just to see here, we are exactly 10 people in, in our technology transfer office now. What the technology transfer office to be implemented needs also is uh, clear policies on ownership. Um, this was uh, clearly defined by, uh, by law in Switzerland a couple of years ago. Uh, the institutions or so the universities would um, uh, own the intellectual property rights of all inventions, software, if there is copyright, uh, generated by the employees of the university. And re this really helped a lot because the industrial partner, licensee or whatever, the company, knows exactly uh, we, with whom it has to discuss, to negotiate with who is the owner of the invention. Of course, and I will tell you a little bit more on that later, um, in case of collaboration agreement, research agreements with industry, we implemented a, a, a principle on ownership which says that um, the inventions are transferred to the industrial partner but only 
if the industrial partner files a patent application on such inventions. If not, the results belong to the university. And, uh, and why that? It's, it's because doing that, uh, both parties can really uh, uh, have their missions accomplished. The, the industrial partner would protect the IP, so it has the advantage and the protection for that IP, and as soon as the, the, the patent application is filed, the researchers can f publish their scientific paper, can, can publish, go to the conference, or, uh, or, 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 uh, or have the, the, the article published in a, in a review. The motivation for inventors. This is also something that we, we developed, and I think it is really uh, necessary. What we did, uh, there are several models I, I show you here the one that we, uh, we implemented, is whenever a finan financial return is, is coming from the industrial partner uh, within a, because it, there was an invention that was patented and uh, uh, they made products or they used services on a commercial basis, uh, there was an agreement <laughs> with the university. Uh, so from the, uh, from the income that was uh, generated, first we reimburse the patent costs. It is important because many times, uh, well, uh, all the time, it's the university that files the patent applications, uh, the first, the priority patent applications at their costs. And uh, I imagine it, it's the same, uh, it's the same here. Uh, what, what, what we do afterwards, so after that reimbursement, uh, the rest of it is uh, distributed in three thirds one third goes to the inventor, inventors, one third goes to the lab, and one third goes to the institution. So that you have uh, all those internal stakeholders motivated by that uh, technology transfer. So, which are the TTO activities? I mentioned before we are doing a lot of contracts and we started with that. With the years and years we did only contracts. We had only one license agreement uh, in the early 90s. So we did a lot of research agreements, service agreements and it is important because this helps to build that trust in the relationship between industry and university. IP, intellectual property, we are doing more and more now evaluation of patent of inventions, protection, deciding which uh, strategy uh, in order to protect the, um, our inventions. Of course also, and it takes more and more, more time because we, we really have more and more cases of inventions and, and patents, one has to manage the, those portfolio in, and it takes really time. Uh, the third activity which is uh, growing is licensing and uh, also, of course, uh, other technology transfer agreements. In some cases, we would assign uh, a patent or a prototype or some recipe, but uh, if we have to do so, usually, generally, we would not assign a patent. We will talk maybe later about that. What we have to do also is to distribute these revenues. Uh, we have to interact with startups. We started this uh, technology transfer accelerator because many times the inventions are very early stage, so they need to be developed one step further by making a prototype or an advanced proof of concept. Uh, or, uh, uh, for example, in the, in the um, uh, bio world, uh, for example, a toxicology study or uh, uh, some um, uh, biocompatibility for some materials. This would all help to um, uh, upgrade the value and to, to decrease the risk from the industrial uh, partner in order that he, he's uh, attracted, interested to, uh, to enter into a relationship with, uh, with us. Uh, what we did a lot also is establish and work at these uh, uh, technology transfer policies uh, both with the government, there were proposals made by the university technology transfer office, by our, mainly our legal councils, um, to the government in order to establish some common rules 
that can be applied to all other universities to have this common ground. And the teaching, this is really important and, uh, and I think we, we, it's absolutely necessary to raise the, the awareness um, in the university ecosystem about technology transfer, about uh, innovation culture. So, uh, so, so that those, those researchers uh, can uh, not only uh, publish great papers in great journals, but can also be driven by the, uh, the wish to see sometime a product on the market based on their uh, research. Contracts. Which kind of contracts? Research contracts, service contracts, industrial grants. These are uh, early stage agreement for evaluation purposes. Uh, we do a lot also of, of non-disclosure agreements. This is the first thing you have to sign with an industrial partner when you enter in discussion with him, when you, you have a, an invention that is not already published. If you have already published your invention, you don't need an NDA anymore. Uh, and also in, in the biofield, the material transfer agreements we, which, which are more and more important because actually we launched about, uh, yeah, I think 12 years ago, a life science department for, for research uh, activities and, and this uh, uh, becomes more and more important. Research contracts, just to show you here what the, the principle, the main principle of a research contract. Uh, I mentioned before the company has the priority to protect interesting results coming from the university. Then those results, the invention, is transferred to the company if a patent is filed by the company. There, there are some maybe three months or six months given to the company to evaluate and decide whether it is interested to file or not a patent application on the invention. Then in that case, company would have exclusive rights on that invention, which is patented, in its field of use. Not all fields of use. So one has to define precisely which field of use makes sense for the company. It's the field where the company is active, of course. In order to allow the university to continue to valorize and, and to, to perform research activities with the industry outside that field of use, which is an exclusivity of the, the company, uh, we would have a back license because we transfer the invention. So we have a back license with sub-licensing rights so that you, uh, the, the lab can, can work with a number of other partners, industrial partners, for other applications in other market sectors. So we, this will not be blocking for the further development of, of research activities in, in, uh, in co collaboration with industry. So there are no secret results because what we would do is uh, uh, if we wish to publish uh, a scientific paper, we'd submit that to a company. The company would say, okay, uh, well, this makes sense. It's interesting for me to file a patent application. They would file a patent application and then we can uh, publish those results. So it's absolutely, uh, th there is no contradiction. Um, we do have a, an overhead, so uh, we can talk maybe later, if you wish, of how, how we prepare the, those budgets for, for the research contracts. We have an overhead, an internal overhead for indirect costs, which is 40% in case of those contracts. If I have a tip that we, we, uh, we um, uh, give more and more to our uh, researchers is uh, to protect the background IP before you're entering into an agreement with an industrial partner because doing that you will keep the value. If not, everything that we, you will do in the collaboration with the, uh, with the company and you will have much less uh, impact to negotiate rights and potential incomes from the company. So before entering even into a European project uh, or other collaborations, think about what do I have today? You certainly have a number of things uh, which are new, novel, which are not published, and uh, uh, it 
to make really sense to file a patent application on them. And you'll see later, but just file. The other type of contracts, you, you certainly also have a lot of them, uh, are the service agreements, ser the service contracts, where in this case all rights are transferred to the company, the institution remains owner of the methods and tools. Don't give away your methods and tools because you will not be able to use them uh, for other projects later. Uh, the use and publication clauses are uh, a little bit uh, tougher than uh, in the research agreements. Many times uh, the, company, uh, the company coming to you and uh, for a specific service would like everything to be kept confidential. So it's up to you to agree if yes or not. If, if you don't agree, you, you can argue and say, oh, no, I, I cannot do that. I want to publish my results, but I give you the opportunity to protect them first. There is a higher overhead of 60% for those kind of agreements. Well, this slide shows you a little bit the, the development of our activities, and I will switch now to more to, to the licensing part, to the invention and patent protection part. Um, uh, so you can see that uh, in 1995, uh, we had maybe, yeah, what, 10 invention disclosures from our, all our labs. Uh, we filed a number of patent applications and we had maybe, uh, it, that was maybe the one or two licenses that we, that we, we granted. So you see that from 95 to 2012, uh, uh, we have now about 110 invention disclosure per year. So 110 invention disclosure that we have to work on to evaluate, to discuss them with the invent, to, to, to think about which uh, potential they have. Three inventions per day. Sorry? Uh, uh, sorry, yeah. one invention in three days. Uh, yeah, if you take all the, well, we are not usually working on Saturdays and, and, and Sundays, but uh, it's, it's about that. Um, uh, what's also interesting is that uh, you see here we file actually about uh, two-thirds of, of those invention disclosures which come to us. And um, we license well, in 2012, a little bit less than 50% of them. But there were years where it was much better because actually what's in important for us, it's not really the, the blue, the, 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 patent, uh, pr the priority patent applications file because we can easily file. It does not cost so much. What's important as, a, uh, as, a track, as, a, as an indicator is how much of those inventions that we protected, we spend money to, to protect, are licensed so that we get money back. Okay, so coming to the, to this, to, to, to the invention path, uh, I, I call it like that, uh, it starts with the, this invention uh, disclosure, so even Archimed, uh, out of his bath, uh, should come to our office to, to disclose the invention. We evaluate them with the inventors, then we would uh, file a patent application uh, and uh, then f find potential uh, interest from, the f from industrial partners uh, and naturally make the deal, which is the license deal. Well, it seems very easy, but it isn't usually so. Let's start with the invention disclosures. Uh, this is the first thing you have to do, and uh, I think uh, it's uh, rather straightforward, uh, straightforward. You have to identify the inventors and their uh, inventive contributions. You have to uh, uh, be sure that this invention is not coming out of a contract already signed, maybe a service agreement, and the rights are already transferred to the, to the, to the partner, or this, if, if this uh, uh, invention is coming within a research agreement, whereas, uh, in, in, and in that case, the, the company would have already certain rights. So you have to know that. Of course, you need to know the principal dates. You have to have a description of your invention, 
to know where the novelty lies, which applications you can, you can address with that invention so that it helps you to figure out how many of those fields of use you can address. Uh, prior art, uh, this is important. Many times the inventors come to us and they say, well, I know everything. I have been to this and this and this conference, so I know that this invention, uh, well, nobody talked about that and uh, I'm the first one. Many times when we go and have a look in the patent database, we found, find out that there are a number of patent applications that uh, talked about that invention, but uh, the inventors didn't know that. So it is really important before, uh, before filing, not only uh, to, uh, uh, to, um, to go through the uh, uh, publication uh, databases, but also uh, to make patent searches. I think uh, these are, can be done in, uh, in Romania, patent searches, certainly by the OSIM, yes. Uh, and uh, we are doing that, for example, at the Institut Fédéral de Propriété Intellectuelle, so uh, Federal Institute for uh, Intellectual Property. And um, the inventors go there. Sometimes we are going with them uh, for half a day or one day, and they make that search with... Um, uh, with dedicated people, professionals from that service, they learn also a lot how to do it, and they come back with a number of, of documents, and then we examine that, uh, those documents with them in order to see whether there is a prior art or not. Uh, at that first stage, we are still at the invention disclosure, we already discuss and try to have a feeling uh, which could be the opportunities to transfer that invention, which are the opportunities that I can find in order to attract industrial interest or licensing opportunities. So, why patenting in university? I think uh, this is rather clear. Uh, the, the, the reason why we patent in university is absolutely not the same one why patents are filed in industry. Why we're patenting is because we want to attract funding, either through uh, research projects with industry or uh, through licensing. Uh, we are not uh, filing patents for the CV. Uh, we are not filing uh, uh, patents for, um, uh, in order to defend ourselves, the university, against competition. This is what indus industry would do. The, the industry would file patents in order to protect their investments, their products, their processes against the competition. Sometimes uh, also industry files patents to, to have patent portfolio to, to cross-license uh, with other industries. But again, a university does not need to defend itself against any competition. It's really a value that we want to add to our research in order to, to stimulate uh, industrial uh, activities. And of course, yes, another question? No, oh sorry. Uh, uh, the, the second, uh, the, the second uh, reason, of course, is because we want to, to stimulate and we, we want to help the creation of startups. Uh, and you all know that uh, if a startup has no intellectual property rights in an exclusive way, there will be no investment possible in such a startup. Investments by venture capitalists, business angels, foundations, etc. So, said that, it is important that the leadership for patent filing and prosecution passes as soon as possible from university to industry because this will also, uh, patent filing is costly, so you have to, to reduce those costs and to do a lot of, of marketing, well, marketing, uh, of discussions with, uh, uh, with um, uh, potential partners, presenting those, um, those inventions at uh, uh, fairs or, or other uh, events. 
pattern filing strategies. Uh, you will certainly hear that uh, here later on on that in a much more extended way. Uh, what I would just like to show you here is what we are doing in, at EPFL more and more for now about uh, eight, ten years. Um, uh, we try to, as you all know, uh, it all starts with a priority filing of a patent application. And then there are two very important deadlines, uh, 12 months from priority date and 30 months from the priority date. What we want to do is to optimize, to reduce the costs in the very early stages. This is why what we started to do is to file the so-called provisional patent applications. Uh, these are patent applications for which we are not paying the, the taxes and which uh, are pretty, say, low cost. Uh, it's, a, it's less than, uh, so in euros it would make, I don't know, uh, 600 or uh, something like that, 700. Um, of course, in order to be able to do that, you have to prepare a patent application where, where what's important in the provisional patent application is the description of the invention. So you have to prepare a very detailed description of that invention. Uh, it is not like, uh, a patent application is not like publishing a scientific paper. Uh, it's, you have to, to be much more detailed uh, when you prepare that, uh, that description of the invention. Uh, and, and this is many, many times we, of course, we, we spend a lot of time with the, the inventors trying to, to help them how to, um, how to write that, how to prepare this first document that would be handed over to the patent attorney in order that this provisional patent application is filed. One can file, uh, of course, another patent application. For example, you know, three months later, after the first one, there is an improvement or a, a, a further development or something you, you didn't think about at the first filing, and one can file a second patent application and, and bring all these patent applications together in a regular international patent application, which is called PCT, Patent Cooperation Treaty, which starts cost, uh, the, wh where the costs are, are, are much higher. And I don't tell you here because here the costs are really increasing even more than, uh, than the international patent application. So um, uh, an another way to, to optimize cost is to, to think about uh, the market that, uh, which is addressed by your technology. For example, I know if you're talking about automotive market, just make your choice on one country, the U.S. or Germany, and, uh, and that's it. You don't need, as a university, you don't need to have all countries where cars are manufactured or sold uh, to be protected. Just make one, one choice. So this, uh, this is important. Actually, uh, I, I also, also I, uh, like to add here that um, we would stop here. We would not go more than this phase if we do not have an industrial partner having committed to share at least the risks with us. What does risk sharing risk mean is covering the patent costs, at least. So we, many times, in some exceptional cases, and this is why we, we like very much this, is that we have 12 months with this provisional patent application to attract interest. And of course, in those best, best cases, we transfer the, pat, the, the patent cost at this stage. Marketing, this is the tough part, of course, the, the, what we uh, start asking ourselves first um, is to, is there any startup opportunity? Because our policy is to really favor the creation of startups. If we have a technology that may be of interest for a startup uh, or for a large company, we would favor the startup, even if it's more risky. We, 
would uh, present and uh, implement this invention dis uh, disclosures and uh, the, uh, a short uh, description, uh, the IP status also on our website, on our uh, international Swiss, uh, so uh, Swiss is um, uh, the Swiss technology transfer uh, offices all over Switzerland, it's a database, and uh, of course there is Enterprise Europe network that you well know. Uh, very important is the professor's network. This is really the first thing we, we would talk about with, uh, with the labs, with the, with the professor, is w with which, we, which partners do you think of, so in, in that field of, uh, of activity. Uh, we do have our uh, internal network, of course, and sometimes consultants uh, to try to give us some hints uh, uh, where to go uh, for, um, uh, um, uh, for attracting uh, industrial interest. Um, pet, uh, patent databases is a, a very important uh, uh, information uh, tool because many times we can see there uh, which companies filed patents in the same field as ours. So we can have names of companies that we may contact because we we know them, we, we can have a knowledge of, about that in the patent databases. And of course, there are a number of presentations at dedicated events like TechConnect, like I think Enterprise Europe Network and, uh, and other events that you can uh, organize or, or think about. Um, so it, it is important when we are talking about marketing, it's not really marketing, it's really, um, uh, you have to be very active as soon as you file a patent application, you can publish the same day. Please publish. Please uh, start telling to the whole world about your invention the same day you file the patent application because you have a very short time in which you want to attract that partner that would help you to further develop the invention and take over the cost. Uh, I mentioned this uh, early stage accelerator that we, uh, we started a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, this is a, a project uh, that would uh, uh, upgrade the value of uh, an early stage technology and um, that would uh, reduce the, the risk uh, for an industrial partner to invest. Uh, what we're doing is uh, uh, with this program uh, called Enable is uh, the making of prototypes, uh, demonstrators, um, uh, I mentioned before toxicology studies, biocompatibility, uh, benchmarking, uh, in some cases very uh, early stage uh, uh, trials on small animals when we are talking about uh, biotech uh, um, technologies. Uh, and uh, this is really important and many of our uh, uh, industrial partners with whom we are in contact say it really helps a lot because for them uh, it is important to know if an invention coming out of the, the lab, so research results, can really be implemented and further developed as a product. Uh, what we do the same time is in these early stages, uh, we uh, enter into, uh, say, these option agreements uh, where the industry uh, commits to take over, for example, the patent costs. Th their contribution is in this, uh, say, in this uh, um, uh, region, of the, the valley of death region, so-called, uh, there is already, in many cases, an industrial commitment by industry. Many times these projects to do prototypes and the demonstrations can be also um, funded by matching funds from the university or f for, uh, from some other public institution and funds uh, coming from industry. License. I will go rapidly through maybe the, the, main, uh, the main aspect, ingredients of a license, the scope and price. The license can be, you all know, certainly exclusive, can be non-exclusive, everybody has the same right, in all European projects. 
uh, where you enter into consortium agreements with other partners, you have to grant non-exclusive licenses on the foreground which is issued within those um, uh, European projects. This is the non-exclusive license. Then there is also something in between which is the semi-exclusive license. Uh, the scope can be restricted also by field of use and this is uh, the, main, uh, um, uh, the, the, the main restriction that we try to implement in order to keep open as, as broad as possible the potential of the uh, invention. We can restrict with time, so for example, we start uh, uh, licensing on an exclusive basis for five years or three years and then convert that exclusivity into a, a semi-exclusive license and of course the territory. An example, uh, for example, we, uh, I show you here, it's, a, it's an integrated processing, it was a patent on a, on a, uh, on a process uh, for um, um, fiber uh, reinforced materials uh, developed at uh, EPFL and uh, uh, w this process could uh, be used to make uh, a number of, of, uh, of products, for example uh, seeds, so the automotive industry and we license that to uh, uh, a company, uh, uh, an automotive company, but also with the same process you could do for example, uh, uh, frames for cycles, you could use it for tennis rackets or for other, for example, hollow composite parts for uh, reservoir or other applications. We usually use that royalties uh, mechanism because this is really fair for both parties. If the industry is not using the technology, is not selling the product, you will get lower royalties, so uh, a lower amount of royalties. Uh, but if they get uh, a lot, the university gets also a lot. So it, it's really well balanced. Uh, it's very difficult to fix a price at the very beginning. How much is this patent worth? This is a very difficult qu question and it, there are mechanisms that, and calculations that we can use, but the most, uh, the, the most uh, uh, fair one is the one based on royalties. Uh, when you think about royalties, you should also think about the minimum manual royalties. This will force your industrial part of the company to further develop the, uh, the, the product or the service which, which is patented so that it's not uh, frozen or stays in a drawer and nobody uses it. So it's to, to force the, the, the company have a minimum, 1,000 euro per year, 2,000 euro per year, whatever, just to to force them and say, well, I have to pay that university, so, well, uh, or what am I doing? I, am I still developing the product? If I'm developing the product, I can pay that minimum royalty. But if I'm not developing the product, why should I pay? So they would stop the license, and we, it will give you the opportunity to, to go to somebody else. For startups, of course, we cannot ask for any, any cash because there is no cash in a startup, so we would be involved in, in having some uh, a minimum uh, percentage in as shares of, uh, of that company. I, I don't know if this is implementable uh, in Romania. Uh, actually, wh what we are, uh, uh, the, the deals we are used with is to take between 5 and 10 percent of the uh, in shares of that startup um, when it is created or at an investment uh, round. Uh, when you don't know how to calculate royalties, they use the so-called rule of thumb of the 25%. Uh, you calculate the profit and the royalty would be 25% of the profit. I can give you some reference on that. Uh, you will find it maybe on the, on the platform. Uh, I will send, send that later. Uh, of course, you, uh, what's very important is to have benchmarks. Those benchmarks are royalties for several different um, uh, economic sectors, product services, and you can find them in a number of documents uh, such as uh, Les, Nou Les Nouvelles or uh, uh, autumn, uh, autumn Surveys. Uh, royalty can be very low. Uh, I just show you here uh, an example uh, of a technology also that um, was developed at uh, ATPFL. It's, it's based, uh, sorry, uh, it's based on 
Um, uh, it's a holographic microscope, uh, but what holography was well known, so what, what was patented, is basically a subsystem and uh, uh, the controlling and the algorithms for treating the, the image and being able to extract um, to extract um, uh, real time real time data, uh, which is very important when you have to uh, to, to image uh, biological uh, uh, parts like like uh, here you do have you can see neurons. So in the, in that case, for a subsidy, wh what we would uh, applied is was one percent uh, royalties, but on the microscope because it was very difficult to see well which part uh, was my invention to that system that already exists. So we said, okay, it's a symbolic 1% on the whole microscope you sell. So uh, all you need is to have clear policies. I have uh, showed you that. I hope everybody is convinced about that. Uh, you need to build credibility and trust. This is really key. It's a service. Technology transfer is a service. Stay close and follow up with the researchers um, in a continuous way. Uh, you need to have some IP expertise. When you don't know, you ask counselors and, and, and experts. Uh, you need to have some negotiation skills, of course, and uh, legal support. But, uh, but you need to have passion, of course, about that. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's rather easy because it's, it's really a, an exciting field. Um, to say it in, uh, otherwise, to which kind of answers uh, uh, should you uh, be able to, uh, uh, which kind of answers should you, uh, well, to, to <laughs> which kind of questions should you, you be able to answer? Um, the first one is, of course, is my invention worth patenting? Do I have software to embed in the invention? Can I file a patent application on software? Um, is there prior art? Uh, you have to be able to, to answer to that. Um, what do I need to prepare a patent application? I mentioned before, uh, you have to do your prior art search and then to prepare to describe your invention. Just as easy as that. Which patent strategy? We implemented the patent strategy which optimizes this, reduces the cost at the very early stages. Uh, how can I establish a collaboration with a company? Which kind of contract? Is it a collaboration or a service? Which kind of field of use? How do I prepare a budget? How can I enter into a license agreement? different kind of licenses, the scope of a license. How can I market my invention? You should really help your researchers to, to go that way, to, to try to make aware of uh, the, um, the potential uh, interested parties, which are the next step for my startup project. So these are all uh, questions that you should be able to, to answer. And the last slide to take home Protect your invention by filing patent application whenever if it's, uh, it is possible. Use the provisional, also European patent application or the PCT filings in parallel with the Romanian filings. I've heard that it is necessary to file first uh, uh, patent application in the Romanian system, but you can really do both at the same time. Uh, it will, it will uh, really enhance your uh, the, the interest you, you can raise uh, uh, outside Romania and uh, the, the, the cost is, is really low. Disclose and market your invention promptly after filing, same day. You can postpone the filing, but whenever, uh, w when you file, a clock starts and you have 12 months, in a best case, to find a partner. Do not prosecute your patent application beyond the 30 months from the priority filing without commitment for an industrial partner. This is clear why. Um, this is a general rule. Of course, if you do have, a, you feel you have a key invention, something which is very important, you may do so, but the costs are extremely high. And uh, uh, at least uh, in, in, 
at EPFL, you, we, we would not go beyond those uh, 30 months. Avoid filing patent application in joint ownership. Uh, for example, we had in, in some past cases a number of patent applications with other universities. It's a, it's, it's a nightmare. You have to consult every day uh, for any decision, and it, it's, it's the best way that nothing is valorized. So, mulțumesc pentru atenție.